If my brother will bear with me, and if you will bear with me, I'm going to ask you to turn to Philippians again. Chapter 1 of Philippians, just for an expression, just breaking into one of Paul's prison prayers here, and uh, look together with me, uh, verse number 9, I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in judgment or discernment, that ye may approve things that are excellent. The idea of that is that you might be able to discern what really matters. To be able to discern what really matters. Now that has been, I think, if I can summarize the ministry of our brethren that has gone through this weekend, that in many ways has been the theme of what we have been considering. What really matters. Paul is going to deal in every chapter of Philippians with something that really matters. Something that is better than something else. So in chapter 1, he's going to remind us here that the preaching of the gospel, the proclaiming of the name of Christ was more important than his reputation. Critics and cynics were all around trying to defame him, trying to lessen his influence. Didn't matter to Paul. Christ was preached. That was far more important than Paul's reputation. Chapter 2, others were more important than Paul. We have that so clearly given to us and what we have had privilege to be reading already in chapter number 2, thinking of others. doesn't mean that we go around with the idea of speaking about how horrible we are, but it's really thinking of others first. Someone has said that genuine humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's thinking of yourself less. And that's what Paul did. Thinking of himself less. Others first. Chapter 3, our brother has read to us already something that is surpassing, the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. And in chapter 4, he reminds us the peace of God is better than understanding all the facts. The peace of God which passes understanding. So in every single chapter, he's bringing before us something that really matters, something that surpasses. Now come back again to chapter number 3. And we're just going to break in to where, near to where our brother read. Verse number 12. Philippians chapter 3 and verse number 12. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, I press on, if that I may apprehend that for which also I was apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then again, the verses our brother just read to us in verse number 20, our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change the bodies that have been humiliated, our humiliated bodies because of sin, that it may be fashioned like unto his body of glory, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. Now I'm just going to come right to the point because time is limited and I don't wish to add or detract from what our brother has said. There's our brother Norman Crawford who frequently as he dealt with this chapter divided the chapter in a very helpful way. It's his alliteration, not mine, so please bear with me. He speaks of the language of the advisor in the first three verses, the warning that he gives. He speaks then of the list of his attainments, seven things he, took, he could as a Jew have taken tremendous pride in beginning with ancestral background all the way through to his very, very careful keeping of the law, his list of attainments. Then, especially where we are looking at the ledger of the accountant, what he put on the positive side, what he put on the negative side, the ledger of the accountant. He moves then to the longing of the athlete as he presses on toward the tape and he's resting the finish. He reminds us as well of the lament of the apostle as he thinks of the enemies of the cross of Christ. And he ends, of course, where our brother has brought us to, to the look of anticipation as we are looking for the Savior, the Lord from heaven. But I want you to notice with me, and maybe it would just be helpful to do this. Look with me again at chapter number 3. Notice in verse number 1, he speaks of writing the same things. Look down at verse number 7. But what things? Look at verse number 8. But all things. Look down the chapter further at uh, verse number 13. Forgetting 
those things. And finally, at the end of the chapter, in uh, verse number 19, who mind earthly things. Now all of that, just as a background, for what I want you to see in verse number 13, one thing, one thing. There was a man who received this sight and he said, One thing I know. The Lord Jesus told a woman as she sat at his feet, One thing is needful. The Lord Jesus Christ, as well, rather, uh, in, in Psalm 27, the psalmist says, One thing have I desired. Peter tells us, Be not ignorant, be not, be not ignorant of this one thing. But here we are reminded of one thing. The passion of his life. A man who had a passion and it was one thing he was going in for. So in the 15 or so minutes left to me, I want to speak to you about narrow-minded Christians. We've been accused of that, of course. One of the labels that are attached to anyone who professes to be a Christian is narrow-mindedness. Well, thank God there is such a thing as narrow-minded Christians. Here's a man whose mind was so narrow Nothing else was allowed to invade it. Nothing else was allowed to, in any way, rival this one tremendous passion of his life. This one thing I do. In fact, if you uh, get out your Greek interlinear, you will find that those five words, this one thing I do, it's really one word in the original. Now, we can't put it into one word, but it's like one thing. If, if one thing were one word, that's what he's saying here. This is it. This is the passion of my life. Forgetting everything, this is the passion of my life. There is one thing I desire, one passion that fills me and thrills me, and he's going to take us to that in the portion that is before us. But I see a man making an honest assessment about his life. Not as though I had already attained. Now conferences, thank God, accomplish many different ends. One of them should be, and I hope we are all doing it as we sat through the weekend, an honest assessment of where we are in the Christian life. There is a great danger, and it gets even worse as you get older to my age, of just putting life on cruise control, figuring you've done your bit, you've served your generation, and it's time just to cruise on home. Cruise control Christianity is a, a tremendous deficit, tremendous problem in terms of living and running the Christian life. The danger of cruise control Christianity. Content with where we are, content with what we know, and just content with how life is going. Now our brother has already touched on this, so you'll just allow me to underline it again. The Christian life is lived with a tension between contentment and discontentment. I should be content, as he mentioned already, with all the circumstances of my life. But I should be very discontent with where I am as far as a Christian in my life. Contentment with what is natural, a discontentment with what I have spirit, with uh, my attainments spiritually. That's where Paul begins here. He, mentioned, he tells us here, I haven't already attained. I am being, here's the great apostle, likely 30 years after the Damascus Road experience, a mature believer, someone who had been serving God, planting assemblies, seeing souls saved, now in a prison in his own hired house in Rome. And yet, he says, this is not the pinnacle to which I am moving. This is not really the goal I have in mind for my life. Discontentment. It would be wonderful if God could stoke into the heart of some believers here, a discontentment with where I am, what I've attained to. There is, of course, a danger with morbid introspection. That's not what we're speaking about here. Some of us are more prone to that than others, and it, it can be a very, very paralyzing experience. We're not talking about morbid introspection, looking at all your faults, looking at all your shortcomings, thinking of all the failure you've had in the past. That's not what's before us here. Paul is not looking at his failure so much. He's got his eye on a goal. And he realized, I haven't reached the goal of my life yet. Look at verse, uh, compare verses 7 and 8 for just a moment. 
Notice in verse 7 he says, what things were gained. So here are the things that were gained. Seven things he's just mentioned. He lists seven things on the accountant's ledger. And he makes them all one complete loss. What things were gained to me, those were one big loss. He says in verse number 7, for Christ. But now notice what he says further on. He tells us not just those things. But now he says everything, all things. But not only were they lost, but now they're like dung. And not it's not just that I might know Christ, but the surpassing excellency of the knowledge of Christ. He's growing. He began on the Damascus Road seeing everything but one big loss, so he could know Christ. But now he's been on the road for a while, and he realizes Christ is growing greater and greater and greater in his estimation, in his vision, and he looks back, not just those seven things, but anything and everything anyone could ever think of as being worthwhile. One big Dunghill pile, because of the surpassing knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Paul was captured by Christ on the Damascus Road. Paul was captivated by Christ for the rest of his life. That's what our brother has been trying to bring before us, that our hearts might be captivated by Christ. Don't look within. That's morbid introspection. You know, uh, I'm not responding to what you're saying. I don't feel anything. Look at Christ. Look at Christ. The captivating Christ, as we have here. So here's a man who's willing to face an honest assessment of where he is and how, what, what he has attained to in his life. But then he's making a choice. Well, we speak about forgetting those things which are behind. And we've all, I've ministered on this as well and made the same blunder. And I'm not accusing anyone else of what I haven't done as well. We think of uh, forgetting those things which are behind. We speak about, you know, you've got to forget your failures. You've got to forget your shortcomings and just run the race. Paul isn't speaking about failures here. Paul's speaking about everything you could take pride in. He listened seven of them earlier. It's interesting, there are seven down stoopings of the Lord Jesus in chapter 2. Seven down stoopings of the Apostle Paul in chapter 3, being made conformable to his death. And so here in chapter 3, he's not speaking about past failure. He's speaking about what every Jew would have prided himself in, what he would have worn as a badge of honor among his own people, everything that men could ascribe that would be of worth. He says all of that. He says, I am willing, he says, to just let all that go, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before. An honest confession. And now here are honors that he's willing to just abandon. Just, just let them go. They meant nothing to him. And now we are told something about the ambition, the longing of his heart. That I may, he says here, this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark. I think I can uh, apply this in a very personal way to everyone here. I am sure that unless you are unusual, as a young person, you have some long-range goal in mind. And there's nothing wrong with it. Education. I, I have to get that degree or uh, a career move, and I've got to step up in the company, or uh, an athlete training for a particular sport. A long-range goal, the prize. Having that long-range goal enables you to put up with an awful lot in between. If it's that degree in four years, you, don't, you may complain about it, but you, you do the exams. You go through the courses that are drudgery. You put up with the teachers who are boring. And all the, all the different inconveniences because you have a long-range goal in life. And you know there are going to be difficulties on the way. Here is a man that had a long-range goal, and nothing was going to stop him. Nothing was going to hinder him reaching for the goal. Nothing was going to somehow make him feel it's, it's too big a price to pay, and I can't possibly do it. His long-range goal was such, everything else, everything else was secondary. All the things that may have turned others aside didn't turn Paul aside. I have a long-range goal that I want to reach. Most of you who are younger would not know the name of Florence Chadwick. It was a name that was very common in my generation. 
So we're going way back to 1952, before the vast majority of you were even seeing the light of day. 1952, Florence Chadwick, who had before that been the first woman to swim across the English Channel, attempted to swim from Catalina Island off the coast of California to the mainland of California, about a 25 or 26 mile swim. She got into the water off the island of Catalina one morning, foggy morning, dreary morning, cold, got into the water and began her swim. Very foggy, very difficult swim. And she kept asking for the boat that was following her to, you know, I just can't do it, take me out. They kept urging her on, urging her on. Finally, she says, I can't take it anymore. You've got to take me out. So they pulled her out. The next morning, she had a news conference. She said, I was only a half mile from shore. If I could have seen the shore, I would have kept going. If I could have seen the shore, I would have kept going. Only a half mile to finish the race. Paul had his eye on a, a goal. And it wasn't going to stop a half mile short. It wasn't going to let the foggy nature of the culture in which he lived somehow hinder him from going all the way. He was going to finish what he started. A man with a long range goal, willing to give all he had that he might accomplish what he had in mind as his goal. I would take it that he viewed this that he's speaking about. I haven't already attained. I haven't really attained what I want to attain. And it's the reason that Christ saved me. And, and it's the reason really that his grace laid hold of me. And I want to really grasp that. And I want to fulfill it to the very best of my ability. And he says, I'm willing, I'm willing to deal with anything that comes in between. I think I mentioned yesterday, we're, we're living in an age of mass distractions. You know what it's like. You can hardly get down on your knees to pray without your phone telling you you've got a text message or you've got a phone call. Or, and everything is bombarding constantly. So many things that are here to distract us from goals in life, from this ultimate goal that Paul had before him. Paul says, I will let nothing distract me because really I have a goal, a long-range ultimate goal in view. I think about a man in the Bible whose name was John the Baptist. You recall that when on that scene when Mary comes to visit Elizabeth and uh, Mary comes in and we're told that Elizabeth says, the, uh, from whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord, five times people call him my Lord. We heard one of them already, Paul, Christ Jesus, my Lord. Mary says, Elizabeth says to the babe in the womb, he's my Lord. Look up the other three, people who owned him as my Lord. But nevertheless, when the, when the voice sounded, the babe leaped in my womb. John rejoiced at the coming of Christ. How does John end his days? He must increase, I decrease. This my joy. This my joy. He had joy at the advent of Christ. He had full joy at the ascendancy of Christ, the preeminence of Christ in his life. Paul said, this is what I have before me. The all-consuming, all-satisfying Christ. That's my goal in life. That's what I want to do. He is my Lord. Just in case you think Paul is the only narrow-minded Christian, there's another man in the Bible by the name of Peter. And Peter is uh, likely in his late 60s, maybe even cresting towards 70, and he's about ready to lay down his life. He knows he's soon to depart, to depart from this tent, his tabernacle, as he says. As he's signing off on his last letter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, he says, I want you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. He says, that is what I have. In, he says, my goal for you, the goal I have had, is to grow more like Christ and to grow in the knowledge of Christ. He says, grow and keep growing is really the thought of that verse. To keep growing, knowing more of Christ, becoming more like Christ. And so Peter signs in as well. Here's a man who has an outstretched hand as well. He says, I stretch forth this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth to those things which are before, I press toward the mark. A man who is his arm outstretched, reaching for the goal in life. 
all of his effort was going into this tremendous undertaking. He was pressing forward with all of his might, with all of his ability. Now you might say, well, you haven't told us yet what this goal is. To be in heaven? That goal was settled maybe 30 years ago on the Damascus Road. Paul had no question about being in heaven. Maybe some would say, well, it's really the judgment seat of Christ and, and the reward and the bema and all. I know that's what many think. You'll forgive me if I differ. What does Paul have in mind? What is the ultimate goal in Paul's life? What is it, why is it that he wants to know more of Christ? Why is it that he's willing to endure everything in light of this goal? What is his ultimate goal in life? What, is, what should be my ultimate goal in life? I think what Paul has in mind is being like the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 8, that's why we were saved. Whom he did for no, predestinated to be conformed to the image of his Son. God has in view as the ultimate goal in your life and mine, likeness to Christ. The chapter ends with physical likeness to Christ. Bodies transformed, but Paul says, in the meantime, awaiting that day, awaiting that tremendous day of revelation. In the meantime, what I want to do is become more and more like Christ in my life. Any other goal surpass that? Any other goal really worth living for other than likeness to Christ? Paul was so enraptured with the person of Christ. It filled his vision. All that mattered to him was becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ. This one thing I do. It was D.L. Moody years ago who said, I would rather have one man who says, this one thing I do, than 50 men who say, these many things I dabble in. Narrow-minded Christianity. It may not be the uh, kind of epithet you'd like on your uh, linked with your name, but uh, that's what Paul was, a narrow-minded Christian. No other desire. No other thing filling his vision other than becoming like the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ twice over said identical words. The servant is not greater than his Lord. He said as well in Luke chapter 6, the servant is not above his Lord. He says in Matthew chapter 10, it is enough for the servant that he be as his master. Reminded yesterday that discipleship involves being led by the master. It involves learning from the Master. It involves loyalty to the Master. It involves love for the Master. But ultimately, discipleship involves being like the Master. Likeness to Christ. A narrow-minded Christian. This one thing I do. May God help us to leave this conference with a desire that we might become narrow-minded Christians with a single desire to be like the Lord Jesus Christ. That'll put into perspective all the bumps along the way, all the personality clashes in the assembly, all the inconveniences of life. To just be aware that God has brought these things into my life so that I might become more like His Son. Did you ever thank God? Now, it may sound strange. Ever thank God for a Christian that you can't get along with? Your personalities don't mesh. The little things about them bother you and uh, little mannerisms irritate you and just bring out the worst in you. And actually thank God for it because that's really an opportunity for your grace to grow and for you to become more like the Lord Jesus. I don't want to get off on a tangent, but I've often thought the patience and grace the Lord Jesus Christ showed to 12 disciples, they were almost as dense as we are. Time and again he taught them and retaught them the same lessons. How patient, how kind, how gracious. And all the inconveniences and difficulties of life God brings our way all to make us more like Him. And so it enables us to bear with so much, to endure the circumstances, to be content with the circumstances of life while we are discontent with our spiritual attainments. May God help us. And may the teaching we have had from our brother, from the epistle to the Philippians, along with what our brother Joseph has brought us, be a stimulus to us to seek to make Him preeminent in our lives, both as the object of our affection and the goal of all of our activities.